How's going guys, welcome to the channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the demon of shadows and fell in love with Alien. Part 3. If you wants to see awesome fanfiction like this, don't forget to subscribe. Now let's get into the video. Naruto didn't like this. It was too quiet. Slowing down, he came to a stop at a cliff overlooking a large open valley of stone and rock dust. Pulling out a map, Naruto glanced over it to try and figure out where they were, but it was difficult to tell when there were no outstanding landmarks, compasses didn't work, and the map he had was vague and not well made. Even then, he didn't have a pinpoint location on Danzo, and his banshees weren't having much luck scouting the Dark Lands, since everything looked just about the same for miles and miles. Plus, him and his ghosts when they weren't cloaked stuck out like blood on snow. Naruto hissed to himself. He knew he should have spent more time scouting the area first before searching for Danzo. Just as he put the map away, something happened. One of his ghosts shrieked in pain as it was suddenly pounced upon. Standing on its back was some kind of wolf that was covered in stone-like hairs or scales, its mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth. Over a dozen more stood on the rocks around them. The one standing on top of the ghost bit into its neck, only roar in pain, as the xenomorph's acidic blood sprayed it in the face and inside of its mouth. As it backed away and started rubbing its face on the ground in a futile attempt to get rid of the blood, Naruto charged the beast and pounced on its back, digging his claws into its height as he speared his tail into the creature's left flank. Bucking, the creature tried to knock Naruto off, but it only succeeded in enraging the young man. Racking his claws down the creature's sides and back, Naruto tore into it furiously before biting down on the creature's newly exposed spine, crushing the bone in his jaws. Giving a strangled yowl of pain, the beast crumpled like a wet cardboard box under him. Looking up at the other similar creatures with a bloodied maw, Naruto snarled along with his ghosts as they dared the beasts to attack them. Roaring in outrage, the beasts attacked them, but the advantage of surprise was now gone. Within minutes, the creatures were killed with only two ghosts having been lost, the first death included. As the skirmish came to an end, the banshees swooped down and landed, hissing as they neared to the corpses of the unknown creatures. PCH freaking predatory beasts Naruto grumbled as he approached one and grabbed it by the neck, lifting it up to examine it a bit closer. If there are predators, there is prey and if there is prey, then this place isn't as deserted as I first thought. He then approached the corpse of the ghost that had been pounced on in the beginning. From the bite marks in its neck, Naruto figured their teeth to be deathly sharp that could no doubt scratch even a dragon Zeno's thick hide in their jaws to be strong enough to crush stone. Their claws were sharp and rather long, most likely to let them grip the rocky terrain and prey better. Stay alert. Naruto hissed at his group of xenomorphs. We're not alone. Acknowledging his warning with quiet hisses and shrieks, the banshees took off into the sky again as Naruto and his ghosts continued on their journey. For hours, they stalked through the barren lands and searched for Danzo's location. After nearly 12 hours straight, Naruto and his xenomorphs chose one of the smaller caves that didn't extend past the surface. The ghosts took their places along the walls, while the banshees clung to the ceiling with their hook-like talons, before hanging from their feet and wrapped their wings around them much like roosting bats, something Naruto filed away for later, as he himself went to the very back of the cave and dug out a pit for himself. Before he could rest, however, Naruto decided to take an extra precaution, just in case any other predatory animal in the region chose to drop by for an unwanted visit. Dot. Oten. Doryuhiki. Naruto stated calmly and quietly as he placed his hands on the ground before the earth outside of the cave entrance rose up to seal off the cave. Nodding stiffly in approval of the technique, Naruto turned around and went back to his pit. Crawling in and curling up into a ball, Naruto wrapped his tail around him and closed his eyes. Neither he nor his chosen Xenomers had rested properly in the past two days. He just hoped Tamari was alright. Two days later. Clawing at the fallen rubble, Naruto and his ghosts quickly started digging. They had finally found a tunnel that was man-made, and Naruto recognized it as the same kind that Danzo had in his base in Konoha. However, just to be safe, Naruto had sent a Kage Bunshin to check for traps. The clone had barely made it five feet before explosive tags detonated and caved in the tunnel entrance. Take to the skies. Search for anyone that may try to escape and capture them alive. Go. Naruto ordered the Banshees, who quickly took off to carry out their king's orders. After a couple more minutes of digging, Naruto found it futile. Hissing furiously, he had his ghost step back before he charged a large amount of chakra into his right forearm, which was engulfed in black shadowy smoke. The Amiyadama, Dark Missile. Naruto snarled as he fired the projectile, which bore through the rubble and shot down the tunnel, dissolving any traps it made contact with. After firing it, Naruto sped down the tunnel in his technique's wake, his ghosts following him closely. Within minutes, they swarmed into a large stone chamber that sported a sizable crater in the wall opposite to the tunnel. Ah Yuzumaki I see you found my hideout yet again. A familiar voice taunted from the shadows. 
Snarling in rage, Naruto spun on his heel and fired off Yami Mori at the source. Batting it aside with his cane, Danzo stepped out of the shadows partially. Danzo Naruto hissed, snarling in anger. Just as he was about to charge the cripple and slay him, Danzo flipped open the top of his cane's handle, revealing a button, before thumping the end of his cane on the ground. A moment later, the wall behind Danzo slowly slid down into the ground, revealing the unconscious Tamari bound with rope and Dracus chained in the ground. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Yuzumaki. Danzo warned as his last two root commanders dropped down beside him, Torin and Fu. Naruto recognized them since they were the only ones left alive apart from a nameless Mednin that wasn't in the room at the moment. Clenching his fists in anger, Naruto started pacing back and forth, his eyes locked on Danzo. Who the heck do you think you are? You stole warriors and eggs from my hive. Naruto bellowed as his tail flailed around in explosive anger. You destroyed my root and nearly killed me. Danzo answered back in a cold manner. I think we broke even. Roaring in anger, Naruto smashed his fists on the ground, shattering several meters of stone radiating out from the point of impact. Torin and Fu tensed, truly surprised by Naruto's show of immense strength. Fu, who was a sensor, hadn't detected a hint of chakra used in the attack, which worried the man all the more. Even Torun was hesitant to fight the mighty being. He had heard about the Uzumaki's chakra shield that said man called Yamiui. The loyal root Aburami did not know if his insects could get through this rumored Yamiui technique in the man's arsenal. If they couldn't and the man had his shield up the whole time, Torun knew his tojutsu and most of his ninjutsu techniques would be useless. Even kunai, shuriken, and exploding tags would be useless against the man. Anzo stood unfazed, his thumb still hovering over the button. He was curious as to why Naruto or his creatures had stopped the moment he revealed the button. It was almost as if they knew about the ace hidden in his sleeve. From the moment the button was revealed, Naruto hadn't come any closer than 30 feet, and those white creatures behind him were almost 10 feet farther. Odd. You won't escape this place alive, Danzo Naruto snarled as he prepared to use something he learned from the Banshees. Giving his ghosts a mental command on what to do, Naruto hunched forward and looked his eyes on Danzo, snarling angrily. Oh? And what makes you think you live long enough to kill me? Danzo remarked with a slight smug smirk. His smirk was quickly smacked right off when Naruto dropped his head, and the ends of the dorsal tubes on his back opened up. Suddenly, a deep thrum roared out from Naruto and resonated throughout the chamber, unbalancing Danzo and his two root commanders, as the sound attacked their eardrums directly. As they clutched their ears and struggled to maintain balance, the unaffected ghost surged forward and pounced on Torin and Fu, quickly knocking them out, while other ghosts attacked Danzo. One grabbed the cane in its mouth and snapped it in two, two more ghosts burned off Danzo's right arm at the shoulder with some of their acidic blood, and three more ghosts bit into the man's ankles and remaining wrist before holding him down. The thrum slowly died down and when it did, Naruto stood up straight again as he approached Danzo and placed his foot on the man's chest. The one-armed man was bleeding from his ears and nose, his right shoulder bleeding slightly, despite the acidic xenomorph blood cauterizing the wound for the most part. That's how, fucker. Naruto growled as he pressed down on the man's chest, making it harder for Danzo to breath. Decking the cripple across the face, Naruto knocked him out. He knew of the seal the traitor wore on his chest. Naruto wasn't stupid. Reaching down, Naruto tore off the bandages covering the man's left eye, before pulling a scroll out of a pocket and unsealing a jar filled with a clear light blue liquid. Sitting down on the man's chest, Naruto opened the jar and set it down. He then grabbed the man by the neck and jaw, before digging his claws into the flesh around the man's Sharingan eye. Plucking it out with the optic nerve fully intact, Naruto put it in the jar, closed it, and sealed it away for easy transport. Nodding over to Tamari and Dracus, Naruto sent the ghosts to free the captured pair and get them out of the area. Naruto then walked over to the man's severed arm and placed a preservation seal and a containment seal on it before sealing it away into a scroll. While Danzo may have pissed him off a great deal, Naruto knew the man was quite skilled in staying alive. As Dracus with Tamari in the harness on its back lumbered through the largest corridor there was and out of the building, Naruto turned to his ghosts and waited a moment for his banshees to glide into the chamber with a root Mednin and several nondescript scientists. Walking over and backhanding the Mednin across the face, the man quickly woke up with a pained groan. What was Danzo doing with my warriors and eggs? Naruto hissed, baring his fangs. The man didn't say anything, but Naruto could see the intense fear in the man's eyes. Grabbing him by the jaw and forcing his mouth open, Naruto pulled the man's tongue out to find a seal on it. Growling in anger, Naruto dropped the man on the floor and went back to Danzo. Grabbing the one-armed man by the neck, Naruto dragged him outside and tossed him across the ground before firing a single Yami Mori at the man, destroying the man's head and upper torso. Not a moment later, a giant black sphere spread out from the corpse until it was roughly 60 feet in diameter. 
After about a minute, the sphere shrunk back down until it disappeared, leaving the rest of Danzo's corpse to fall to the bottom of the Bolek crater. Tossing a Gakito Bakudin into the crater, Naruto walked back into the base, setting the bomb off a moment later. As he walked into the chamber, the Med Nin started shaking in fear as he saw the dark look on Naruto's face. Grabbing the man by the throat, Naruto pulled him closer, snarling angrily. Tell me everything you know. Now. Naruto hissed. The man cracked in an instant, spilling everything he knew. Scowling, Naruto grabbed the Mednin by the face and tossed him back over to the Banshees with a mental command to loose a facehugger on him and the other scientists. His ghosts moved to flank him protectively, but Naruto waved his hand in dismissal. Not quite understanding the situation, the ghosts obeyed and disappeared in puffs of smoke as they reverse summoned themselves back to the hive in Kanoha. Puchius. Naruto mumbled as he pressed his hand to the ground. In a cloud of smoke, six beings appeared. As it cleared, the forms of six Predalians were revealed. Not long after capturing the female half-blood, Naruto had performed the ritual on her with queen blood and then mated with her. Less than four days later, the female gave birth to nearly three dozen Predalians. He planned on increasing their numbers as soon as he got back to the hive. Due to Danzo's experiments and actions, there are now several dozen rogue warriors in this base. Naruto stated calmly, though coldly. He was reluctant to give the order, but it was needed. Before the man's death, Danzo had control over them. They had been the ones responsible for the capture of Dracus and Tamari. When we got close to the base, Danzo recalled them all back here and sealed off the entire base just after my clone set off the explosive tags. One of the Predalians let out a guttural clicking sound much like the full-blooded Yotja. Naruto sighed and then nodded in answer to the being's question. Yes, now that Danzo is dead, the warriors are now out of control, and while they may not be able to cause much, if any havoc here, there is the chance of them escaping to any nearby island nations and spreading even further. Naruto explained before pausing. Sighing softly, Naruto gave the order. You are to kill them on sight. No exceptions. If you find anyone alive in the base that the Banshees hadn't found, you know what to do. Nodding slightly, the six Predalians took off down separate corridors, leaving Naruto with the last one. Oten. Doryu Hiki. Naruto stated calmly as he placed his hand on the wall, a stone slab rising behind him to seal off the tunnels, his Predalians entered along with his own tunnel. Unsealing an assortment of Predator technology, Naruto started arming himself with a short-barreled rifle-type plasma caster, a number of laser nets and other assorted devices stored in several pouches clipped to the back of his belt, and a power glove on his left forearm with a SATCOM installed on it. He then took his personalized gunmetal gray mask, which was like that of a snarling xenomorph, and put it on. He also put on a pauldron on his shoulders that didn't interfere with his dorsal tubes. Attaching a pair of plasma casters to the shoulder mounts, Naruto armed the plasma caster in his hands and shouldered it before moving on. While he could probably hunt down and kill the xenomorphs in the area on his own, Naruto decided to try something a little different, hence the predator armor and weaponry. Switching between visual frequencies, Naruto eventually found one that allowed him to track down his rogue kin. Following the trails left behind by the Xenomers, Naruto cautiously made his way through the tunnels, pipes lining the walls and ceilings in this particular sector. Instinct screaming at him, Naruto rolled forward to duck the clawed swipe of a warrior, before ending in a crouch and turning around, firing a sphere of blue plasma straight into the chest of the same warrior. As it fell to the floor dead and its blood started eating away at the stone, Naruto continued on. Passing by a side tunnel, Naruto tossed a laser net device on the wall, said device activating once he passed by it. Despite this being the first hunt he had participated in using predator technology, Naruto had practiced using the weapons and armor, along with studying translating their language verbal and written and reverse engineering their technology. Now that he thought about, he had started acting like one in small ways, such as starting his own trophy collection. He only had a few skulls, but then again, he had only started about a month ago. Tossing another laser net to seal off the main tunnel behind him, Naruto came to a stop. In front of him was a large chamber with a sizable pool of water off to one side, which was definitely not man-made. Along the walls were several openings like vents, offshoot tunnels, side tunnels, etc. What put Naruto on edge, however, was the fact that the walls, ceiling, and floor were covered in resin. Should they already have the basics of a hive going, and if that human was right, there are still a number of unused eggs in the base, along with a single queen's egg thought Naruto, as he pointed his rifle at a facehugger that lunged at him from a vent above his head, firing and killing it without even looking at it. Cycling through visual frequencies again, Naruto noticed a number of heat signatures in the chamber, all human. They were suspended about halfway up the 20-foot high walls, dead facehuggers lying below each one. Arming his rifle and taking aim, Naruto fired a round into the chest of one human, his shoulder cannons loosing salvo after salvo into the chests of other humans. 
A chestburster forced its way out of a human female's ribcage, only to be killed a moment later by a burst of plasma. Just then, warriors started entering the chamber from the numerous tunnels leading into the room. Luckily, Naruto was able to hold them back long enough for his predalians to come barreling through separate tunnels and aid him in the slaughter of the rogue Xenomers. When the room was cleared, Naruto lowered his rifle and gazed upon the dozens of warrior carcasses, their blood eating away at the resonant stone on the floor and walls. Stop fucking with me, Kami Naruto grumbled angrily to himself as he folded the barrel of his rifle in half and then folded the stock before holstering it on his left hip. His shoulder cannon swiveled around and deactivated as he stared at the water basin before him. Growling quietly, Naruto tossed a couple laser nets that sealed off all of the tunnels leading into the chamber before turning back to the basin. Without a second thought, Naruto and his predalians dove into the water and started swimming through the flooded tunnel rather quickly. Like the chamber, the walls of the tunnel were coated in resin. Mentally cursing, Naruto spotted a pair of warriors swimming towards them. Two predalians surged forward and quickly broke the necks of both rogues, leaving their corpses to float in the water. After several minutes, they eventually came upon the exit and found themselves in the middle of a large crater that Naruto figured to be on the coast, since there was a large number of underwater tunnels that connected here, most of which being flooded with salt water. Tossing a laser net down, Naruto sealed off the tunnel he and his dual breed escorts just came from. Taking a quick look around the area, Naruto found the area to be void of any Xenomers. Taking a look in each of the pools of water, he found the tunnels to be the same as the one they came from a minute ago. Sealing them off with laser nets, Naruto placed a tag device which was set to a certain frequency so as not to alert any predators on off-planet in the center of the crater to find it again when he comes back later with reinforcements. After checking the map on the heads-up display in his mask, Naruto found that he and his predalians were nearly 20 miles from Danzo's base. Scowling at that, Naruto returned to the underwater tunnel they had originally gone through, turning off the laser net long enough for him and his predalians to get back into the water before reactivating the device. Doing the same thing with the various other laser nets they came upon, they came to a stop at the earthen barrier Naruto had set up earlier. Activating his power glove, Naruto punched a hole through the six-foot-thick stone wall before climbing out, the predalians following a moment later. Once they were all out, Naruto resealed the barrier, using his chakra to patch up the hole. As they left the base, Naruto pressed a button on his satcom before several dozen laser nets activated all across Danzo's base, sealing off several key locations. During his interrogation of the Mednin, Naruto had sent out a number of Kage Bunshin to seal off certain sectors that had already been secured by his ghosts and banshees. Dismissing his predalians, Naruto made his way over to the hulking form of Dracus, who now sported a number of claw marks all over its body, most of them were just minor scratches with one or two that drew blood. I see you weren't hurt too bad, Dracus. Naruto stated calmly as he put his hand on one of the more serious lashes that racked diagonally across Dracus's forehead. It would definitely scar. Dracus hissed softly in reply as it lowered its body enough for Naruto to climb onto its back and into the harness. Let's go back to Konoha. I'll deal with this irritation later. Naruto ordered with a slight growl, referring to the rogue's enemers. While virtually the same, Danzo's interference had messed with the Zeno's mental link with Naruto, his queen and empress, Haku, and Yujito. Because of that, the rogue Xenomers had returned to their original instincts without anyone to control them, two of them to be specific, continue the existence of the hive and kill all threats to the hive. Naruto scowled from behind his mask as he thought about that. If he didn't act quick, Naruto knew that his work would be for nothing if an outbreak of rogue Xenomers occurred. Blissfully unaware of the chaos, Tamari slept peacefully beside him. Four hours later. The old hag still won't come back, eh? Naruto asked as he appeared behind Suratobi, startling the Hokage as the elderly man was doing paperwork. Chuckling at that, Naruto walked around and sat down in one of the chairs, propping his feet up on the edge of the desk. Suratobi gave the teen a flat look at that, but said nothing about it. No, she won't even come back to heal Sasuke. Suratobi answered as he got back to his paperwork. Naruto scoffed and leaned back in his chair, smirking. Good. That brat deserves it. Naruto commented coldly as he pulled a file out of his cloak and dropped it on top of the Sandayami's desk. Danzo's dead, but the crippled bastard fucked with my hive. Now these an outbreak of rogue Xenomers in the Dark Lands. I just came back to tell you about it and take care of a couple things here in Konoha before going back to finish them off in a few days. I see Saratobi trailed off as he opened the file and started looking through it. Among some reports and data sheets were photos of Danzo's little side projects. A couple said side projects being experimentations on Xenomers. Luckily, none of them were successful. I hear that Akatsuki is on the move. Naruto commented as he gave Suratobi a serious look. Yes. I assume you know what I know, so I'll keep it brief. 
Akatsuki always travel in pairs, all nine of its members are S-rank criminals, and they are hunting for the Biju. Ergo, they are hunting down the Jinchuriki. If Yureya doesn't convince Tsunade to come back to Kanoha soon, he'll miss the chance to get vital information from his informants all across the continent. As much as I would love to see my student become Gondaime, I now know that she is unfit for it after reading your report on that mission. Saratobi explained as he sighed quietly. That's why I'm going to hand the title of Hokage over to you in three years. Oh, hell no. Naruto declared as he shot to his feet. You know damn well that I belong out on the field of battle. You know I hate being confined and caged. Remember what happened when that one fucker tried putting me in a cage when I was nine? Saratobi went pale and shivered at the thought. Even now, seven years after the fact, they still haven't found every piece of that guy. Besides, it's not my dream to be Hokage anymore Naruto snarled. I have no love for this village anymore, and you know that. You know damn well that the first chance I get to leave this village for good is the day I disappear. Tsuritobi nodded sadly as Naruto turned and left. The San de Ami knew Naruto could leave at any time, but he also knew that Naruto still had precious people here in the village. Well, himself and her. Naruto growled softly as he finished putting his armor back on, leaving the chamber that held the captured half-blood female. It would only be a few days until his predalian ranks were doubled. As he walked, a shadowy figure followed behind him, staying in the darkest part of the tunnel. Yes our lord. The person asked, being the same one that had informed Naruto of Danzo's thievery. How go the repairs on the ship? Naruto growled out in question. Since we found the Half-Blood ship, the need for repairs for the old mothership have been cut down by 50%, the person paused for a moment. The hull is at 79% capacity, the engines are at 82% capacity, weapon systems are at 64% capacity, shield systems are at 48% capacity, and life support systems are at 93% capacity. I see. How long until all systems are at full capacity? Exactly 2 years, 7 months, 3 weeks, 5 days, and 22 hours. DCH. Figures Naruto grumbled as he rubbed the back of his neck and stopped walking. How long until the formula is finished? Three days and fifteen hours after the mothership is fully repaired. God damn it Naruto hissed as he sat down on a large stone that just happened to be there. And what of the ruins in Snow Country? From what has been translated, the ruins seem to be a temple built thousands of years ago by Yotja Naruto rolled his eyes at that, already having guessed that from when he first visited the place after its discovery. It also seems to have been used to test young predators and see if they were fit to become full-fledged hunters. Oh? Explain. Naruto ordered as he beeped an eyebrow. After scanning the structure numerous times at different frequencies, we have discovered that the entire temple is like that of a moving puzzle. The person paused once more, both of Naruto's eyebrows having risen at that. The entire temple was built with hundreds of different mechanisms inside of it, meant to move certain parts of the interior in a certain way to construct different pathways. I see. Thank Naruto started, but he was interrupted. There is more knowing he now had his king's full attention, the person continued. Hidden deep below the temple is a cooler of sorts that contains a cryogenically frozen queen. When someone enters the temple and steps on a certain pressure plate, the queen is removed from the cooler and thawed before she starts laying eggs that are then moved to a sacrificial chamber in the upper levels via a conveyor belt where a human sacrifice would await them. At least, that is what would happen back when the temple was actually used by the humans a millennia ago when they worshipped the Yatja. Naruto scowled at that. Not only does he have to deal with the rogue Xenomorphs and their queen, there's the risk of the queen in the temple being released by accident and her own hive causing issues for him. It would be total chaos, and that would leave him with only one option. Fuck Naruto groaned as he slammed his fist against the wall, causing spider web cracks to spread out from the point of impact and to shake the tunnel slightly. Gleam what information you can from the temple in two years and seal it off completely. I don't want a fucking flea to make its way into that building. Divert most of your attention on the mothership and the formula. I want them done and fast. As you wish, so shall it be done the person vanished into the shadows, not unlike Naruto does on occasion. Scowling deeply from behind his mask, Naruto crushed a rock in his hands until it was dust. He did not need this annoyance right now. He was already having trouble with the Xenomorphs in the Dark Lands, but the possibility of them being in Snow Country, too. If he had to resort to that just to keep them from spreading and completely eliminating all traces of the human race, Naruto would do it. No matter how much it may hurt him. Gasping for the much-needed oxygen, the Iwichuanan leaned against the boulder she was hiding behind, careful to remain silent and listen for those those things. She didn't know what they were, but they had come out of nowhere and attacked the base, quickly capturing her two teammates and almost a dozen of her comrades within minutes. Biting her bottom lip and closing her eyes, tears started to glide down her cheeks. 
Hearing a faint noise, she slowly opened her eyes, only for them to widen instantly upon seeing the eyeless visage of one of those creatures. Shivering in fear, paralyzed, the woman could only stare in horror as the demonic being moved closer to her. Whimpering slightly as the creature grasped her by the throat, she closed her eyes, not wanting to stare at the beast's mandibles and fangs anymore. Hissing quietly, the Predalien gripped her jaw to open it before forcing its tongue down her throat and depositing six embryos inside of her. As it did, the woman blacked out. Glancing at the Predalien out of the corner of his eye, Naruto turned his eyes back towards the newly vacated Iwa outpost in the distance, standing stoically atop a boulder a short distance away from the woman and Predalien. The walls bore holes punched in them by the Predalians and himself, a few small fires had sprung up between the walls and the main building, and a few acid burns in various places. It had been the 14th one they raided in the past week, the reason being that Kanoha was now at war with Iwa after their two Jinchuriki the Gobi and Rakubi containers disappeared. Iwa quickly blamed Kanoha for it and demanded that Hinarito be handed over to them. Both sides of the council nearly agreed to their terms to either avoid war or to rid Kanoha of its scourge the Sande Ami and a select few, being the only ones to reject the offer, before Naruto did something he never before thought of doing. That had been two months ago, and since then, Naruto had been on the warpath, purposefully hunting down groups of Iwa shinobi and either slaughtering them or unleashing his predalians on them. At first, it had only been a single outpost every day, seven a week, but the number had risen by one each week for the past two months. The current number was 84 outposts, each one having about 50 Chuanin to Jounin level shinobi. Each of them were turned into hosts of six Xenomers per person, the limit Naruto had placed on his predalians when it came to impregnating humans. It had been just over two years since he had killed Danzo and started hunting down the rogue Xenomers in the Dark Lands. He still wore the Predator armor and weapons, adding only a whip and two shurikens. He had completely foregone his armored cloak as well. Apart from that, Naruto had grown to a height of 7'3", and now styled his hair in thin braided dreadlocks, similar to a predator's hair, the tips having turned crimson over the past year. Leave the woman. We're going back to Kanoha. Naruto growled as he dropped down from the boulder. The Predalian obeyed and let the woman drop to the ground. Letting out a guttural clicking sound, the Predalian stepped up beside its king and fell in step beside him. Shaking his head slightly, Naruto continued walking east, the 19 other Predalians following behind him. No. I think Iwa has received the message by now. If they haven't he trailed off for a moment as a dome of pale blue plasma erupted from within the main structure of the outpost that was now five miles behind them, the dome expanding until it was almost eight miles in diameter. He had constructed a number of explosive devices similar to those installed in virtually every left gauntlet the Yatja have ever made. While just as destructive, Naruto's variations of the bombs did not have the massive blast range of the originals. Luckily, his Predalians knowing of the bomb's range had moved the new hosts a fair distance away to keep them safe long enough to birth new Xenomers. DCH. Still alive, eh? Naruto grumbled as he sensed someone very familiar to him on the very edge of his senses. One of the Predalians hissed, also noticing the presence. No. Leave him be. I lost too many of you last time we battled. Even I nearly lost to him, but then again, so did he. Naruto growled softly as he placed a hand over the left side of his chest, a ragged circular scar being right over his heart. A number of scars made by a pair of parallel serrated blades littered the rest of his chest and torso. Naruto even sported a pair of diagonal slash marks across his mask, going from the top left to the bottom right. The particular person he was referring to was a rather testy yatja that Naruto called Fang, who had been stalking the mountain ranges and canyons of Earth Country for the past two years. Fang, unlike his kin, did not like to sneak around or attack from a distance with a shoulder cannon, he preferred skill and in-your-face fighting. For this reason, Fang was armed with mostly bladed weaponry with moderate to heavy armor. The kin to piss Naruto off because they were practically complete opposites, equipment-wise. While lightly armored, Naruto carried mostly ranged weaponry such as his new shoulder cannons, dual tri-barreled plasma casters, his trusty plasma rifle, a pair of plasma pistols, and a smaller version of the plasma caster mounted on his right gauntlet between his wrist blades. Sure, he could probably kick Fang around like a pinball for days, but the damn hunter's armor was so damn thick that not even a Yami Mori at full power could dent the shit. That alone was enough to make Naruto worry and also make him realize that he had depended on his Yami Mori as well as his Yami Ui too much and that they were only hindering him more than helping him. Since their first encounter six months ago, Naruto had stopped using his Yami Mori and Yami Ui while increasing his speed and agility so as to avoid getting shredded by Fang's blades next time they clash. Sighing quietly, he stepped up the pace and took off, the Predalians following close behind him. They were finished with Iwa for now, so Naruto decided to leave them to Fang and return to Konoha. Next day. 
As they neared the edge of the forest, the Predalians took off to return to the hive, while Naruto continued on his path. He quickly came upon the main gate of Konoha, which was guarded not by humans, but by six runners and eight warriors. In fact, Konoha was no longer under the control of Konoha Shinobi, the San de Ami Hokage, or the council, Naruto was. Ghosts were spaced out along the top of the wall, titans lumbered through the streets, stalkers patrolled the rooftops, banshees resided in the tall trees of the forest of death and clung to the walls of tall buildings within Konoha's walls, drones guarded certain positions of the village, such as the gates and the Hokage Tower, and dragons slunk through the shadows of the alleyways. Konoha was under a severe lockdown, meaning that all humans were unable to enter exit the village and everyone was under a strict curfew. Almost all shinobi had been restrained with chakra suppression seals and an arsenal of others usually placed on high-level shinobi criminals. To begin with, they had all been given the chance to join him. Only 5% joined him immediately, another 10% not long after. One by one, those that joined him were instructed on what to do for the ritual before performing it within the hive under Konoha. Most of them received either titan or praetorian blood, while the sensor type shinobi received stalker blood. Those that didn't join. Well, they're now guarding Konoha once again, but in a different way. Naruto-sama. The Jounin greeted as he landed beside the armored figure of his king. Hot Aki. Naruto responded as he continued on his way to the Hokage Tower, having slowed to a walk. Kakashi, like the other shinobi that had joined him, had the same blade tip tail as Naruto and Haku, four dorsal tubes on their back, black hair, black eyes, claws and fangs, and black fang tattoos on their cheeks. Those with bloodlines still had them. Like most every other hybrid in Naruto's army, Kakashi was wearing a pair of black and white camouflage pants, black elbow-length fingerless gloves, dark gray bracers, dark gray greaves, black cloth face masks for those who want them, Kakashi, and a black hit I ate. Over it all was a hooded black cloak that hid their dorsal tubes without making them uncomfortable. Any riots from the civilians while I was gone? Naruto asked as he glanced around from behind his mask, looking for anything that might be out of place, could never be too careful, could he? Especially so when he had a number of Yotja hunters stalking the lands all across the continent, a hive of rogue xenomorphs to eliminate, prevent the potential threat of a third xenomorph hive popping up into existence, deal with Akatsuki, and maintain control over an entire country. Luckily, no. Kakashi replied. They're too afraid of the xenomorphs to even stare at one for more than five seconds, let alone rebel. Naruto chuckled quietly at that, finding it quite surprising he had complete control over Konoha and was already planning an assault on the fire daimyo in the next few weeks. Good. Make sure they stay that way. Naruto flicked through visual frequencies in his mask, thinking he saw something ahead of them. Dismissing it as his mind playing tricks on him, Naruto waved his hand slightly to dismiss Kakashi before activating his Yamiui and using it to cloak himself. He then used his father's most famous jutsu, Horation. Vanishing and reappearing at the seal ride he had placed in the Hokage's office, Naruto sat down on the backless chair he had placed in the office behind the desk, which was now made of metal with electronic screen built into the top, with four currently inactive holographic projectors on each corner. In front of him stood the shinobi he had graduated with nearly three years ago, San Sasuke and Sakura, along with their senseis and Team Nine guy, had opposed him and was quickly dealt with by several dragons. The rookie Jen and now Chuanin and their Jounin sensei had joined him for one reason or another. Any news of his location? Naruto asked as he tapped the screen on his desk, causing it to light up with a number of reports on it. Shino, who had joined Naruto immediately after the offer was made, spoke first. No. He has been covering his tracks to the point even an Inuzuka couldn't track him. Reported Shino. Scowling behind his mask. Demate. I want you to take six stalkers and twelve runners with you. They should be able to hunt him down. Remember, I just want you to locate him. Do not engage. Naruto ordered without looking up from the desk. I want to deal with that little shit myself for all the trouble he has caused me. Nodding silently, teammate Shunshin had a way to do as they were told. Teams 9 and 10. You six will be going on a little hunting trip for me. I need to extract my informant from Akatsuki, but his partner needs to be captured as well to keep the man from informing their leader. My informant's identity shall remain a secret for the time being. Naruto explained to a degree as he brought up a holographic image of two shinobi, one had slicked back hair and carried a large tri-bladed scythe, while the other wore a mask over the lower half of his face. These are your targets. You leave at dawn. Dismissed. Naruto stated calmly as the two teams left via the door. Once they left, Naruto returned to his chair and tapped the screen slightly with the tip of the claw on his index finger, the holographic image disappearing. As he got back to reading his reports, a cloaked predator stepped out of the shadows beside the door. You know Naruto started quietly without looking up. If my guard sense you, they won't hesitate to kill you. 
I know, but they won't sense me. The predator remarked, using a translator built into its mask to communicate properly. You've learned well, I see. Ha. Huh. You shouldn't be surprised since it was you who taught me. Naruto remarked, still not having looked up since he knew the Yatya before him wouldn't be showing himself. So why are you here? Nothing much. Just wanted to warn you that the queen and her guards are going to be coming to this planet in a couple months. The Yatya stated in a sarcastically casual tone that clearly denounced his annoyance on the subject. Not only that, but she knows about you. Fencing at the mention of the queen, Naruto shut off his desk computer, grabbed the cloaked Yotja by the neck, and used Horatian to appear inside of his study. Slamming the cloaked Yotja against the wall, Naruto snarled angrily. What the fuck do you mean that she is coming here and that she knows about me? Naruto hissed, inwardly afraid. Of all people, the damn bloody queen of the Yotja clans was coming here to this shitty little rock on the edge of the galaxy. Just that. The predator growled quietly as it grabbed Naruto's hand and pried the Xenoman's hand from its neck. I don't like it any more than you do. I'm a bad blood, remember? They'll kill me without a second thought, strip me of my weapons, and leave my corpse to rot in the middle of nowhere. It is the most disgraceful sentencing we have. PCH. Naruto growled and turned around, ripping off his mask and tossing it as he started pacing. Do you know if she's here to eliminate me or what? That I do not know. God damn it, Cordal. What do you know? Naruto barked as he spun on his heel and snarled at Cordal. He didn't look much different from two years ago, apart from a pair of jagged parallel scars, running down the left side of his face, from just above his left eye down to his jawline. They were yet another memento of his battles with Fang. You said I got two months, right? Naruto growled as he ran a hand through his hair. Cordal nodded silently. Then I'll just speed up my original plans. I'm sick of playing cat and mouse with those Akatsuki assholes, and I'm fed up with dealing with those damn rogues. Why the hell did you let Danzo escape the first time? You knew he would cause trouble if he got away. Cordal asked gruffly. Naruto growled quietly again. He should have died from his injuries, damn it. He had a damn medic with him when he fled. Naruto snapped as he threw a kunai made of the same metals as Predator Shuriken's. Easily catching the knife by the loop, Cordal stopped it before it even came close to touching the bad blood's mask. Damn. Never thought he would get under your skin this bad. Cordal mused quietly, watching as Naruto produced a number of kunai and launched them in various directions, each one piercing their targets and not stopping until they were down to the metal ring at the base of the handle. Dropping like flies, ten Iwa Anbu fell to the ground, dead, each had a kunai embedded in their heart, throat, both kidneys, and one in the liver. All being instant kill spots. Portal gave what sounded like a whistle in mock surprise as he released his cloaking device, though still hidden by the shadows he was standing in. It was still easy to tell that Naruto was a good six to eight inches taller than Cordal. Naruto scoffed. The predator was lazy and would sooner have someone else do something than do it himself. Leave before you end up like them. Naruto growled, not wanting to be around anyone. Cordal scoffed and rolled his eyes from behind his mask. Black you could kill Cordal was interrupted when he felt the icy points of Naruto's wrist blades pressed against his abdomen and the tip of a kunai held in a reverse grip by Naruto's left hand pressed against his throat. Cordal froze instantly, now fully aware that his student had finally surpassed him, and all on a technicality. And maybe you can Cordal muse quietly as he slowly moved the blades aside, while Naruto narrowed his eyes in fury. As the predator left, Naruto thought back on Cordal's first rule, the first thing Cordal had told him when the bad-blooded Yotja agreed to train him, never let your guard down or you're dead. Cordal had let his guard down, if only for a moment. And had it been for real and not just a warning, the predator would have been killed. Two months. Two goddamn months since Cordal told him the fucking queen was coming to the elemental countries. Naruto fully armed and armored dismissed those thoughts as he and his guards a pair of predaliens drew closer to the chosen location of the Kage summit, called by the Rakage. Rakus let out a shrill cry as it descended upon the Three Wolves Mountains, alarming many of the armored samurai of the neutral country. Naruto couldn't help laughing quietly to himself, knowing Dracus had only done that for its own amusement. Landing heavily in a snow-covered clearing near the entrance of the compound, Naruto rubbed the top of Dracus's head as he got off, the two Predalians flanking him. Normally, Naruto would go with two Praetorians or Titans, but they were rather heavy, and Dracus could only carry so much weight. As he and his escorts neared the entrance, Naruto was greeted by a pair of samurai that led them to the room where the actual meeting would take place. Balcony. Stay there. Naruto ordered the two Predalians through their mental link, who hissed in response before leaping up to the designated balcony, startling most of the other escorts for the four other Kages, while causing the two from Iwa to bristle in anger. As he and the Tsuchikage looked at each other, the tension in the room skyrocketed. Taking his seat, Naruto crossed his arms over his chest and leaned back in his chair. Place your hats on the table Mifune, Iron Country's leader, started. 
As one, the four Kages removed their respective hats and set them down on the table, while Naruto, smirking slightly, slowly removed his mask and set it down as well to be at least semi-respectful. You are here today because the Raikage has called this meeting. My name is Mifun. I will be your moderator. This meeting will now begin. I'll go first. Listen up. Gara calmly began as he leaned forward with his elbows on the table, hands hovering on top of each other just in front of his face. Before he could begin, the ever ill-tempered Tsuchikage interrupted. The makeup of the five Kages sure has changed. You must be something special to be made Kazikage at your age. Enoki started, scowling. Your father must have taught you right, but apparently he forgot to instill in you any manners. I guess Gara began to reply calmly and slowly, unaffected by that Tsuchikage's comment. That's why I'm here as Kazikage. Ahahaha. <laughs> Cheeky brat. Enoki laughed out sarcastically. Naruto was amused by their banter, finding it a little funny. Tsuchikage, please stop interrupting. The Gondai Mei Mizukagi cut in admonishingly before facing Gara. Kazikage, please continue. I'm a former host. Gara started again. Akatsuki captured me and nearly killed me extracting the beast. That's why I believe Akatsuki is extremely dangerous. Who does that Tsuchikage think he is? Kenkuro quietly growled under his breath, only for Tamari to punch him in the arm. Be quiet. She hissed. Naruto smirked a little more, having overheard the pair. I requested aid from the other Kages many times, but they all ignored me. Gara continued. Except for the former Hokage. Though at this point, with so many hosts captured, it's too late for aid. HMPH if a country has had its host captured, it has no business giving other countries orders. It's an embarrassment. The Tsuchikage cut in again, scowling in annoyance. You should have tried to recover it in secret. Once it's stolen, you can't expect other countries to help you. Hey you want to talk, Tsuchikage. All eyes turned to Naruto as he leaned forward, his own eyes locked on the Tsuchikage. You tried to demand of Konoha that I be handed over to Iwa after you lost your own two hosts. You nearly got your way had I not stepped in and took control of Konoha. The Sailanoki snarled, only to go silent immediately when Naruto's plasma rifle hummed to life, aimed directly at the Tsuchikage's face. You know what this can do to a human skull at full power, don't you? Naruto quietly inquired mockingly, eyes narrowed in anger. The other Kages tensed while their escorts, sans Naruto's, appeared beside their respective leaders. You remember what I did to your outposts in the span of a few weeks, with only a fraction of my army, don't you? Growling in anger, Anoki waved his guards away, the others reluctantly following suit. Naruto flashed his fangs before disarming his rifle and folding it up before holstering it again, crossing his arms back over his chest. Keep it up, Anoki, and Iwa follows the example of your outposts. Naruto growled. No one dared admonish the giant, knowing full well what Naruto was capable of. It was mostly for this reason that none of Iwa's allies helped when Naruto started his rampage a month ago. Turning to Gara, Naruto continued. Sorry for the interruption, Kazikage. Please go on. Gara nodded to him in appreciation, the two having formed a mild bond of kinship, due to them being former hosts of Biju. Appearance honor Gara started as he faced the Tsuchikage. I don't have time for that ridiculous old-fashioned thinking. HMPH Bratz Anoki mentally growled, angered by both Naruto and Gara. As the others started talking again, Naruto half listened to them as he suddenly felt a presence on the very edge of his sight. Ignoring it for the moment, Naruto spoke up again. In any event, the only ones who can truly be said to have controlled the beasts are Ichiha Madara and the Shodaimei Hokage, Hashirama he cut in. And maybe the Yondaimei Mizukagi, Yugura and Raikage's brother, Killer B. But. Quit your yapping. The Raikage bellowed as he smashed his fist on the table, crushing it and causing everyone's guards to appear in front of them, before the splinters even hit the floor, while Naruto simply had his rifle out again, his predalians having remained where they were. As Mifune calmed them down and the guards returned to the balcony, Naruto rifle resting on the table in front of him with his hand loosely grasping it half listened to the other Kage's talk, as he stretched his senses out to try and locate that pesky little presence he felt, which was now somewhere in the compound with three others. There was a fifth and sixth presence, but it was irritating, he couldn't identify or pin either of them down within his sight. Sasuke you little shit Naruto mentally growled, deciding to deal with the brat once he got the chance. Just as he thought that, Mifune interrupted his thoughts. What would you think of forming a five village alliance? The man asked. An alliance? The Raikage asked incredulously. It's a good idea. We're in a state of emergency we have to cooperate. Naruto commented. I like where this is heading. The chain of command should be uniform. Mifu noted. We want to avoid any further confusion. So Inoki began. The question is who will have authority over this new army? You will only fight amongst yourselves interrupted Mifune. So I would like you to respect my position as a neutral party. 
I will decide who among you is best suited for the job. Perfect Naruto mused as he mentally smirked, knowing this was his best chance to gain a foothold in his advance across the elemental countries before that blasted Yotja Queen starts any shit with him. Due to the mental bond with his hive, Naruto's mind was stronger than any normal human mind and gave him the gift of mild suggestive telepathy. It was great for interrogation and converting people to his side, should he require their abilities for a new cast or as an ally of the hive. As such, Naruto began to slowly infiltrate Milfune's thoughts and nudge him in the right direction. What was so great about it was that it didn't require chakra and the affected person had no knowledge of it even occurring. However, it wasn't an easy task to perform and cause Naruto to experience mild headaches afterward. Uzumaki Naruto of Konoha shall act as the head of the alliance. Despite his past actions, I believe he is the best candidate for the position. Mifune proclaimed. Among us all, Konoha is the only one capable of procuring the most troops for the coming war against Akatsuki, and as much as I dislike admitting it, they are far stronger than any average shinobi or samurai and easily replaced. Added with his strategic knowledge and the omnipotent control over his hive, the Hokage is best suited for this role. Naruto grinned as the others looked at him. The Raikage seemed angered with the decision, the Kazikage looked at him with approval, the Mizukage held an expression of indifference, and the Tsuchikage just seemed irked from it all. Even as the Raikage shot to his feet in outrage, Naruto knew he had won the gamble of gaining leadership over the alliance. For one to know of his official crimes and actions and still choose him as the head nominee of an alliance to combat the Akatsuki, Naruto knew he had the advantage over the others. That in the fact he gave Mifune a nudge in the right direction to do it. Either way, it wasn't surprising when Kiri was the beginning of the Akatsuki, Iwa and Suna did business with them on several occasions, and most of Akatsuki's members came from the four previously mentioned hidden villages. Kumo was free game since it held no ties with Akatsuki, but the Raikage was too emotional to properly lead the alliance without causing some problems. That perfect. Naruto mused before noticing a light flashing under his mask. Picking it up and putting it on despite the meeting, Naruto noticed it was a message from Cordal. Opening it, Naruto's good mood was ruined. He went from happy to angry, skipped sad, and now he just felt like kicking the bastard's ass. From what Cordell mentioned in the message, he managed to get in contact with the Queen, and she wants to meet with him in three days. She wanted to meet in Kanoha, of all places, but she made sure to make it clear she was coming on neutral terms. Amit Naruto mentally grumbled as he removed his mask and set it down in front of him. His day just kept getting worse. Naruto's scowl grew deeper when he sensed a new presence in the room, the fifth one he hadn't been able to pin earlier. Jumping to his feet and snatching his chair up in one hand, Naruto threw said chair at the ceiling where the presence was, his rifle held deftly in his other hand, and aimed at the same spot as the chair shattered into wood splinters upon contact with the ceiling. Come out. Now. Naruto snarled as the Kages and their guards jumped to their feet as well, startled by Naruto's actions. Slowly, the form of Zetsu's white half bulged out from the ceiling as if he was in water. The plant-like man opened his mouth to say something, but didn't get the chance to when a ball of pale blue plasma ripped through his neck and head, splattering blood and gore across the ceiling that dripped down to the floor and on the desk. Charging up another shot as he put his mask on, Naruto stretched out his senses to locate his chosen prey and activated his power glove before he punched a hole in the wall, exiting the room through it as his Predalian guards followed after him. Before the others could follow after him, Naruto dropped a laser net behind him and activated it the moment it was in place, blocking off the passageway. Moving quickly, Naruto punched a hole through the floor when he was directly above his target and dropped down to the room below, his predalians breaking off to search for one of the other targets that was attempting to flee. Naruto. The Ichiha growled as he brandished his Shikudo, ready for battle. All around them lay the bodies of almost two to three dozen Iron Country Samurai. Beside Sasuke was Sakura, just as pathetic and weak as she was two years ago. Anzi, bitch. It's been a while. Naruto stated calmly with a slight grin behind his mask, finally feeling better, now that the thorn in his side was right in front of him and ready for him to remove. Let's stop beating around the bush and settle our old score, Icha. You can't stop me, Naruto. A pathetic lowlife like yourself stands no chance against the might of an Icha. The traitor growled, inwardly remembering his last fight with Naruto and the phantom pains from the injuries he sustained during said confrontation. Oh, but I can and I will, Icha. Just stand still for a second and it'll all be over. Naruto growled out before blurring out of sight and lashing out with a left hook, only for Sasuke to barely dodge it with his Manjiku Sharingan blazing. Your Sharingan may have changed, but your skills haven't, Icha. Naruto coldly stated as he continued to lash out with left hooks and elbow drops, which Sasuke continued to dodge says the loser with no skills of his own. Sasuke growled out before the butt of Naruto's rifle slammed into his chin from below and knocked him up into the air. 
Having spent the time to set him up, Naruto lashed out with another left hook to Sasuke's side, while extending the wrist blades on said gauntlet, ripping through the Ichiha's kidneys and intestines in one fell swoop. Like I said last time we met, Ichiha Naruto snarled as he let Sasuke fall to the ground and placed his booted foot on the black-haired man's chest, ignoring Sasuke's cries of pain and Sakura's shrill voice. I always collect what is mine. Breaching down, Naruto plucked Sasuke's left eye and then his right before crushing them both in his hands like rotten grapes. Sasuke, screaming in pain and horror the whole time, was unable to get out from under Naruto's foot. Sakura, in a desperate attempt to save her crush, charged Naruto with a kunai, only for her head to explode in a shower of blood and gore as a ball of plasma ripped through her skull. Pathetic. I thought you would have at least learned a few new tricks or got smarter by now, Sasuke. Naruto taunted sadistically as he charged up another shot at full power and aimed it at Sasuke's head. Enjoy your stay in hell, Ichiha. I'm sure the devil would love to deal with you personally. And another burst of blue and crimson, another victim to Naruto's wrath fell, blood and brain matter splattered across his mask in small droplets. Satisfied with his kill, Naruto reached down and stuck a needle in the man's arm before retrieving a vial of blood, Ichiha blood. He planned on bepising it and altering it slightly to create a new cast of Xenomers. They would prove useful if he could somehow give them the ability to mimic or hypnotize their prey. It would benefit his ghosts the most considering they could use chakra. Before he could think much on it, Naruto was forced to jump over a mutated fist that slammed into the ground where he once stood. It belonged to the originator of the cursed mark, Juugo. Before the man could say anything, Naruto's plasma rifle was aimed at his head. Unable to move fast enough, Juugo watched as an orb of blue plasma ripped through his skull and killed him. Landing lightly on his feet, Naruto folded up his rifle and holstered it before tossing a special container full of solvent that burst upon contact with Sajetsu's chest, quickly breaking the bonds between the water molecules in the man's liquid body. Even as the man screamed in pain, Sajetsu's body evaporated at a rapid pace, eventually killing him. Taking another vial of blood from Juugo for later bepization, Naruto quickly pocketed it just as the others arrived in the room. The women grew pale and grim as they witnessed the brutal slaughter of the four infiltrators. The Raikage glared at Naruto for a moment after seeing the body of Sasuke, but gave him a nod of acknowledgement after a minute in gratitude for avenging his fallen brother. As Naruto left the building and mounted Dracus, his Predalians returned to him with a young red-haired woman with glasses, unconscious. She was of average appearance in terms of assets, and after a bit of digging through her mind, Naruto found her only true talent to be her extreme sensory capabilities. Thinking for a moment, Naruto crouched down beside her. I guess I can use her as a breeder to spawn Xenomorphs with the ability to sense chakra from far distances. Naruto mused out loud as he stood up again and faced his guards. Bind her. We're taking her to the main hive. Growling quietly in confirmation, the Predalians bound the woman, Karen, with rope and set her in the back of the tent-like harness on the back of the great draconic beast that was Dracus. As said winged Xenomorph took flight, Naruto sat in the lotus position and began to meditate, seeking to strengthen his telepathic powers. As he did, the metal orb in his cloak hummed faintly as it gained a barely visible crimson aura. For the rest of the trip back to Konoha, Naruto meditated without interruption as five shinobi shuriken slowly revolved around him while spinning rapidly. Upon landing in Konoha, Naruto opened his eyes, and the shuriken clattered to the floor. Beeping an eyebrow in confusion as he removed his mask, Naruto ignored it and stood up as he motioned for his Predalian guards to bring the woman. During his meditation, Naruto was shown images of what had been, what was, and what was to come if certain things did or did not happen. Because of these visions, Naruto developed a new plan of action. Take her to my lab. Naruto ordered the pair of mixed-breed Xenos as he made his way to the fire tower and to his office, the two Predalians running off with their quarry. Sitting down at his desk, he tapped the screen to turn it on and plugged in his mask before bringing up multiple three-dimensional holographic images. They were scans of Karen's body taken with his mask. He then pulled out three vials of blood and a vial filled with a mixture of xenomorph blood types, before plugging each one into a different ports on his left. Four DNA strands appeared among the images before combining into one, centering around Karen's DNA. DNA compatibility, 56% stated the mechanical voice from the computer. Chance of survival, 73%. DCH Naruto scowled as he heard the percentages. There was too much risk involved if he used so many DNA types with Karen's, but he was surprised by what he heard next. The NA compatibility, 59%, 73%, 95% and holding chance of survival, 79%, 84%, 93%, 98% and holding the computer, continued as Naruto grinned viciously before frowning slightly in confusion about the sudden change. 
Examining each of the DNA strands individually, Naruto found it was none other than Juugo's DNA that enabled the success of the process due to the adaptive and evolving capabilities of the man's genetic coding. Tapping the screen again, Naruto brought up a live video stream of his lab, where Karen was strapped to a table with multiple tubes inserted into her arms, awake and struggling to free herself, no matter how futile it may be. Now, to begin the procedure Naruto mumbled to himself as he tapped another selection, the vials draining and flowing down through the tubes into Karen's body. She cried out in pain as the multiple DNA strands forcefully bonded with her own, changing her. Her tight-fitting shirt became strained as her A-cup breasts began to swell as her hips grew wider and her thighs grew thicker, breaking the seams on her shorts. His grin grew more fiendish as he watched her transformation. He watched as her red hair turned black and her eyes turned blood red, her flesh growing paler with every second until she was bone white. The zipper on her shirt broke as her breasts grew to ample F cups filled with fresh milk, still expanding as droplets of the ivory liquid seeped from her nipples. Her shorts were torn apart and her black panties were busted as her hips grew nearly a foot wider than they originally were, her rear and thighs having gained four inches apiece. Standing up and walking over to a seal array in the corner of the room, Naruto disappeared in a cloud of black smoke before reappearing over a similar array in the laboratory. He walked over to Karen and removed her restraints before stroking her cheek gently as she slowly opened her eyes and looked at him. How are you feeling? He inquired softly as Karen smiled faintly, her mind having already been altered by the xenomorph DNA and knew instinctively that Naruto was her king. He. Wonderful, my master Karen whispered as she gently grabbed his wrist and placed his hand on her full L-cup breast, moaning softly in pleasure as he groped her lovingly. Naruto smirked victoriously when she closed her eyes, knowing he now had the perfect breeder for his hive. Now, if he could only add more genetic material to her compound DNA strain. Three days later. Naruto crossed his arms over his chest, a scowl on his face behind his mask, as he waited for the queen to arrive with her honor guard for their little chat. It wasn't much longer before five figures entered his field of vision. They deactivated their cloaking devices and stood shoulder to shoulder. In the center stood the queen, her golden armor glistening in the dim light of dawn. To her immediate left was a yodja in ancient appearing armor with native-looking decorations on them. On the far left was another wearing heavier armor with curved back-swept adornments on either side that looked like horns, a heavy-bladed staff grasped in his left hand. To the queen's right was another predator wearing heavy armor with tusks and skulls decorating his armor. The last one on the far right was wearing armor Naruto was a bit more familiar with, his armor looked like it was based off of samurai armor, with two swords on his back and two more at his left hip. Good morning, your majesty. Naruto greeted as he bowed partially and turned to the side, holding his arm out in the direction of Konoha. Please do not be afraid of my pets. So long as you do not intend harm to my person or attack them, they will remain docile. Your so-called pets do not frighten me, boy. The queen growled out roughly as she and her guards entered the village. Naruto chuckled lightly at her response, finding her rough exterior to be quite amusing. For now, at least. I sincerely apologize if I disrespected you, your majesty. Naruto apologized calmly as he took the lead and led them to his office. Once there, the queen took a seat in front of his desk as Naruto took his usual spot, the four other predators standing guard around the golden armored female. So what is it you wanted to discuss? Naruto inquired as he removed his mask and set it on the table. He knew wearing his armor would anger the predators, but to him, it was improper not to wear the whole set. I came here to talk about your hive and the future of this planet, Uzumaki Naruto the queen stated as Cordal stepped out of the shadows across the room before standing directly behind her with his arms crossed over his chest. Naruto narrowed his eyes stood up, glaring daggers at the supposed bad blood. What is the meaning of this, Cordal? You dare betray me? Naruto snarled in outrage, his fangs growing sharper as his adrenaline started pumping through his veins. So this part ends here. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, so quickly like this video for second part of this series. And comment down below your thoughts about this series. And now it's time for me to go, bye.